Hi, I'm Pastor Brett, and I want to thank you for watching Guerrilla Christianity on YouTube. Uh, this channel is completely self-funded, and we never ask for donations. We don't do sponsorships. There's one thing that you can do to help us get more viewers, though, and that is to like, comment, and share. And also subscribe to our channel so that you can know when more new content comes up. We put up new content all the time. I want to thank you again for watching. Be blessed. Our epistle lesson is from the book of 1 John and 1 John chapter 3, verses 16 through 24. And it's found on page 242 of the New Testament if you're following along in the Pew Bible. Hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoso hath this world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And hereby we know that we are of the truth, and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart, and knoweth all things. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then we have confidence toward God. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him, because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. And this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. And he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him, and he in him. And hereby we know that he abideth in us by the spirit which he hath given us. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now please remain standing for the reading of God's holy word from the gospel according to St. John chapter 10, beginning at verse 11. Let us hear the word of the Lord for us today. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is an hireling and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming and leaveth the sheep and fleeth, and the wolf catcheth them and scattereth the sheep. The hireling fleeth because he is an hireling and careth not for the sheep. I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. As the Father knoweth me, even so I the Father. Even so know I the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice. And there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Therefore doth my father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it up again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my father. This is the word of the Lord for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. I would also invite you to turn uh, back in your Bibles to the book of 1 John, uh, which is where we've been throughout the Easter season. And we're continuing in our Easter series called Agape, the Love of God. We've been spending our time in the first epistle of John and learning about the light and love of God. So the word that best describes God's love is the Greek word agape. And we find this word defined for us in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Uh, this week we are taking a deeper look at the love that God demonstrated for us in the person and work of Jesus Christ and how we as followers can demonstrate that love to the world that sinners would be saved, and that God would be glorified. Well, we already read this. We're actually going to be reading verses 11 through 24. So we're going to go back to verse 11, which is where we left off last week. We left off with verse 10. And we're going to be reading this verse by verse. So let's uh, prepare our hearts and minds to receive this word. Let us pray. O Lord, your Son showed us the way when he washed the feet of his disciples Jesus, our good shepherd, leads us where we are to go. Give to us willing hearts to follow Jesus wherever he leads us, that we would grow in our discipleship and give to you all glory 
honor, and praise. For we ask it in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Well, it happened again that I, uh, I got into a tiff on Facebook. I know I need to really get away from Facebook um, because I just end up... You know, I don't, I don't mind if somebody says something about my religion, if they disagree with something about what I believe, as long as they represent it well, okay? You can tell me that you don't believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Okay, I do, because that's what it says in the Bible. You could tell me that you don't even believe in God, that there was a creator of the universe. I do, because it tells us in the pages of the Bible, and we see all of creation, and we have a witness that there is a creator in all this, right? That's fine. Do that all day long. But what I don't like is when somebody tells me what my religion believes, and they misrepresent it, and then they attack that. And I'm like, well, that's not the God that I love either. You know? So this week, um, somebody posted a, a picture, and it was a funny picture of a, a girl and her mother, and it was like from the 50s, you know, the little frilly aprons and stuff like that, and they're just in the kitchen, and they're doing their little thing. And the little girl says... Where does hate come from, mommy? Where does hate come from? And the mother replied, mostly religion, dear. That's really disturbing. But that's the world's perception. Religion is defined by hate. Now, I would argue that true Christianity is defined by love. So much so that we see the word agape, this Greek word that we've been studying, almost exclusively in the Bible. Look, I, I, when I was doing research for this, uh, I wanted to give a fair amount of use of the word agape. Where is the word agape used outside of the Bible? I actually put that into a search term on Google. I went through 10 pages of results and every single time it was something from the bible it wasn't something outside of the bible with one exception 10 pages of results and only one exception and guess what that exception was a document that was written in the first century called the dita k if you don't know what the dita k is it is the teachings of the apostles it's an early christian document that is that encapsulates all the teachings of Jesus's followers and it's directed to the early church. So the only place that I could find where the word agape appears outside of the Bible is another Christian document written by Christians for Christians. So agape is really an exclusively Christian concept. And so much, 131 times we see it in the New Testament. 131 times. And yet, and yet the world thinks that we are defined by hate. We are defined by what we, by what we rail against rather than the things that we embrace by love. But that's because <laughs> the most vocal minority the ones who get in everybody's face, the ones who were yelling at people, or the ones who were, you know, all you people are stepping on all my rights, and da, 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 da. and then they'll drop that C-bomb. I'm a Christian! Oh, really? Look, the third commandment in the Ten Commandments tells us, you shall not take the Lord's name in vain. And I think that when we misrepresent God, when we misrepresent Christ, when we bear the name of Christ and misrepresent Him and what He commanded us to do and what to be, that is taking His name in vain. Okay? So, what did Christ command us? He said that the greatest commandment, the greatest commandment, is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. Love, agape, love, sacrificially, giving, 
expecting nothing in return. That's the kind of love that we give to God because that's the kind of love that God gives to us. That's the first and greatest commandment. And then he says the second one is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. And we in the 20th and 21st centuries have twisted that around to mean that we need to love ourselves. But believe me, we don't need help loving ourselves. Okay? Now, you go down to Barnes & Noble or you go on any bookstore and there are shelves and shelves and shelves of books that tell you how to love yourself. The self-help section, Right? And there's really only one section in the bookstore that tells you how to love God, how to love your neighbor. And that's where you find the Bibles, you know, the Christian writings that uh, uh, Christians who have told us time and time again how to love. I met with a, a Methodist pastor from Kansas who had written a book. I, I interviewed him for my podcast um, and he he had written a book on how to love and he he listed all the people in his life who had been difficult to love, but how he was able to love those people, right? And it's interesting. And not only just how he was able to love them, but how they loved him, because it's, a, it's reciprocal. Jesus tells us to love God with our whole heart, to love our neighbor as ourselves. Then he says, love your, you've been told that you are to love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, brace yourself, to love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you. For so does God love you. Be perfect, he says, therefore, as God is perfect. That's hard. Hard. Love your enemies. And... He rounds it all up in his, in his farewell discourse in, in the book of John. He says, a new commandment I give to you. Now, first of all, on the night when he was going to be betrayed, he sat down to dinner, Passover, a Passover meal with his, his disciples. And before the, the meal, he, he stripped off his outer garment. He wrapped a towel around himself. He got a basin of water and he got down on his knees and he washed the feet of his disciples, which is an act of love. It's an act of servitude. And he, but get this, Judas was there. Judas, who was going to betray Jesus, was there when Jesus washed their feet. He washed Judas' feet. He washed Peter's feet. And Peter was going to deny him three times. He told him he was going to deny him. And he said, no, Lord, I'll never deny you. I will die with you. I'm ready to die with you. But what did he do? He denied Jesus three times. He denied him with a curse. And his, all his disciples would abandon him and scatter like sheep without a shepherd. They, were, they would just completely abandon him. He washed their feet. He knew what they were going to do. He washed their feet. And then he said, do you know what I've done for you? You call me master and Lord because I am. You're right. So if I, your master and Lord, have washed your feet, so you should also wash what, my feet? The Lord's feet? He says, you should wash one another's feet. And then he says, I give you a new commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. How did Jesus love us? He loved us sacrificially. He loved us when we were still sinners. He died for us. That's how much Jesus loved us. And that's how Jesus loved us. That's how God loved the world. God so loved the world. Now, I've been, I've been working on my, on my Greek translation, and I will tell you that for God so loved the world isn't really how it reads in the Greek. The way it reads in the Greek is, this is how God loved the world. This is how God's love was demonstrated. That he gave his only son. That whoever believes in him should not perish, shouldn't, but have everlasting life. That's the love of God demonstrated in Jesus Christ. God's love is demonstrated in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We're told in the book of Romans. 
So, yeah, the world is so ready to condemn Christianity as hateful and abusive and unloving, but what we see in Scripture and in the evidence of disciples' lives is the exact opposite. Agape love is the defining characteristic of true Christianity so much, so much so, that I would argue that if one's Christianity doesn't lead them to love others more, it, it's not true Christianity. Christianity should lead us to love and love and love more. We're going to make missteps. We're going to make mistakes. We're going to, uh, we're going to, we're not always going to love perfectly, but increasingly as the Spirit sanctifies us and makes us more complete in him our capacity to love grows and we love one another as he loved us sacrificially all right verse 11 here he's been talking about how god is light and in him there is no darkness that was the first message all the way all the way back in chapter 1 verse 5 this is the message that we declare unto you, that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. And then he goes into the, the, the contrast between sin and righteousness and light and dark. And, and now he turns, he gives us a new message. For, he says, 11, chapter 11, or verse 11, for this is the message that ye heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. From the dawn of creation, God has made us to love us and that we would love him and that we would love one another. That was, that was the very beginning. Again, Jesus says, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another just as I have loved you. He was spit upon. He was beaten. He was he had a crown of thorns placed on his head, bleeding from every pore of his body, and he stretched out his arms willingly. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, he says, by this, you all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. That's how we're supposed to be known. That's the defining characteristic of a Christian is that we love one one another. And yet we don't even see that in, in between denominations. One of the reasons that I reach out to pastors in our community, number one, I need support. I need to be nourished. I need iron to sharpen my iron, right? And so I gather with like-minded brothers who we, we, we pray on Wednesdays. We pray on Wednesdays after we have our prayer meeting here and we come together and what do we have? We have Presbyterian, we have Mennonite, we have uh, Baptist, we have Methodist, we have different denominations, but what is one thing that draws us together? We have difference in polity, we have difference in the way we worship, we have different songs that we sing, we have different prayers that we say, but we have the same Bible and we have the same God and we have the same Lord Jesus Christ and that's what binds us together and that's how we can love one another even when we differ with each other listen I, 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 bring, I mentioned it in the prayer earlier that the United Methodist Church is going to be gathering in Charlotte North Carolina for the general conference the general conference hasn't met in eight years Okay, it's supposed to be a quadrennial uh, gathering, the general conference, but because of COVID, they weren't able to meet in 2020. And then 2021 went by in 2022. They said, you know what? Let the heck with it. We're just going to do it in 2024. And so here we are, we're meeting. This is, by the way, we're, we're meeting this year for the 2020 general conference. How does that make any sense? I don't know. But there was a document that was put out for all people who are going to the general conference. What not to bring. Don't bring these items. And I was really saddened by the fact that on that list of things not to bring, guns, knives, weapons, pepper spray, 
What are we doing as a church? We're, we're saying we're going to be gathering in Christian fellowship and love, and they have to tell us not to bring weapons? And they should be understood, right? It's sad. It's really sad. Unfortunately, the General Conference does tend to bring out the worst in us. Um, I'm going to be watching and I'm, I'm, I'm going to be praying. I'm going to be praying that as a denomination, we can show the world what it means to love one another. We'll see. We'll see what happens. This is the message that you heard from the beginning that we should love one another. Verse 12, not as Cain, who was of that wicked one and slew his brother. And wherefore slew he him? Why did he slew him? Why did he kill him? Because his own works were evil and his brother's righteous. So from the beginning, our love of God was corrupted in our disobedience at the fall. God gave us one commandment. Don't eat the fruit on that tree. They made a beeline for that tree. You know, the, as a matter of fact, they listened to Satan. Here's the thing. When they were, they were listening to the voice of the serpent, the serpent was saying to them, Did God really say you can't eat any fruit in this garden? No, that's not what he said. He said we can't eat the fruit from that tree or else we'll die. He says, oh, you won't die. You won't die. Questioning God, calling into question, doubts rising. He, you're not going to die. You know, God knows that if you eat that fruit, that you, your eyes will be open and you'll be like him. You'll be like God. And you'll know all things. What a cruel and inhuman God you have that he told you not to eat the fruit from that tree. If I were you, what I would do is I'd go straight over there and snatch a fruit off of there and take a bite. That'll show him. And they listened. And they listened. They were disobedient. Cain, their, their child, after they had been evicted from the Garden of Eden, they had two children, Cain and Abel. And in them, our love for one another was corrupted because Cain saw Abel's... We read that in the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock, the most important things, the fat portions... The best of the best. That's what he brought to the Lord. He brought his sacrifice to the Lord because he loved God. Cain brought, the brought his paltry offering because he wanted God to love him. But the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering he had no regard. So Cain was very angry and his face fell. The Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, here's the warning. Sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. It's all the content of his heart. Cain killed Abel because he was jealous, because God loved Abel. God loved Abel because Abel loved God. Cain wanted that love, so he wanted to please God. So he, he gave him an offering and expected God to go, well done, good and faithful servant, but that's not what he heard. So Cain slew Abel because his own works were evil and his brothers were righteous. Verse 13, marvel not, my brother, my brethren, if the world hate you. The world is in opposition to God brought on by Satan's deception. And so in John chapter 15, Jesus himself said, if the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. The world tells us that the greatest love is to love ourselves. That's what's in that song, right? By Whitney Houston. Whitney Houston sang the song, made it famous. George Benson originally played the song, but the song was written for, <coughs> for a documentary about Muhammad Ali. And we hold him up as a bastion of, of what it means to be loving, right? 
What does the what does the the song say? The greatest love of all is easy to achieve. Learning to love yourself is the greatest love of all. The only time the Bible the only when the Bible tells us to love, it always tells us to love something else. Love God, love others, love your neighbor, love your enemy. But then it says in 1 Timothy that we become lovers of ourselves and we desire to soothe our itching ears. And so we go and seek out somebody who's going to say a word that pleases us. So the only time we're ever shown what it means to love ourselves, it's an example of what not to do. Learning to love yourself is the greatest love of all. Muhammad Ali loved himself so much. You know, he, everything was about Muhammad Ali. You know, he, mm, I'm the greatest of all time, you know, and, and <clears throat> he loved himself. But we're told to love others, to love God, to love our enemies, to love one another. Verse 14, we know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. The ability to truly love, agape love, is given to us when we are born again of water and the Spirit. John chapter 5, Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who, has, who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. So we're born dead in our trespasses. We're born again into life and love. Ephesians chapter 2, Paul writes, But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And so love is the assurance of our salvation. We're going to see that again in a little bit. But verse 15, Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. Ooh, that's harsh. Just hate. Hate means you are a murderer. If you, whoever hates his brother is a murderer, and ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. Hate is selfishness birthed. You know, somebody will say, I hate you. And the reason they say that is because they love themselves more. I hate you because I love myself more. True agape love is outward and selfless. I love you more than I love myself. Hate is inward and selfish and ultimately destroys us from within. And so in uh, Matthew chapter 5, Jesus says, You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not murder. And whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you, that everyone who is angry with his brother, just angry, will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. And so, hate is the opposite of love. It, hate is loving myself more than I love you. Love, agape love, is loving you more than I love myself. That doesn't mean disdaining myself or hating myself, but it does mean loving more outwardly. So, God's original message is love. Now we see that in, in verses 16 through 18, we're seeing that God's demonstration of love is in Jesus Christ. Hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. That's what Jesus said. Jesus demonstrated love for us in the upper room when he washed the feet of his disciples, of Judas who would betray him, of Peter who would deny him, of all the disciples who would desert him. He said, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. That's an expression of love, and that's what Jesus did for us. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. We just read this today. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. Verse 17. But whoso hath the world's good 
and seeth his brother have need and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? If you have everything, if you have all your possessions and you see somebody in need and you don't help them, that's not loving. Seeing a need and doing nothing is a sign of selfishness. It's not a sign of selflessness. Agape gives without a second thought. And so James in his epistle writes, what good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and be filled. Without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Think about the differences between the rich young ruler and Zacchaeus. We know them, right? Rich young ruler comes to Jesus and says, Lord, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says to him, you know the commandments. He says, yeah, I've kept them all since my youth. Jesus says, well, you lack one thing. Go sell everything that you have, give to the poor, and then come follow me. And the man went away sad because he had many possessions. The question is, did he have his possessions or did his possessions have him? He cared more about his possessions than he cared about the poor. Now, that is not to say that we all ought to sell everything we have and give to the poor and live in sackcloth and a cardboard box. He didn't say that to everybody. He only said it to the rich young ruler. Now, what happens with Zacchaeus? Zacchaeus was hated. He was a tax collector. Nobody liked him. He was, a, he was a traitor in a turncoat. He was Jewish, but he was ripping off the Jewish people in the name of Rome. And he was short. You know, he's like, you know, Danny DeVito. Nobody likes him, right? He's just an uncomfortable little guy that nobody wanted to be around. But he went and he climbed up in a tree to see Jesus because he knew he was coming by. And Jesus looked up in the tree and saw him and said, Zacchaeus, come on down. I'm going to have lunch at your house today. Everybody's like, why him? Right? But what does Zacchaeus do? How did he respond? He said, Lord, I give all my possessions to the poor. Now, he wasn't saying that he wasn't bragging. He wasn't saying, you know, Lord, look at what I've already done. He said, Lord, this is how much you've touched me. Because you've touched me, I'm going to give everything away to the poor. And if I have defrauded anybody, I will give them back four times as much. And Jesus said, I tell you the truth, today salvation has come to this house. So what's the difference? The difference is Zacchaeus, he didn't care about his possessions because he had the one thing that he always wanted, which was a relationship with Jesus Christ. You know? <clears throat> Verse 18. My little children... Let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. It's not our good deeds that save us. It's our faith that's demonstrated by our good deeds. Not for God's sake, because he knows the heart. Our love for others is a witness to the world that God is good and loving. Again, we need to represent God well. And, and I tell people all the time, listen, don't don't avoid church. Don't avoid Christianity. Don't condemn Christianity because you don't like Christians, all right? Go to the source. Love God. Love Christ. Look in the Bible. What is Jesus all about? Go with that, okay? There's a lot of people who misrepresent Christ, but that's been throughout all history. And that's why, you know, maybe people think that, we, that hate comes from religion. Anyway, now, we've seen that God's original message is love. God's love is demonstrated in the life and work of Jesus Christ. And now, we see that love is our assurance of salvation. Verse 19. And hereby we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. Doubts will arise. We may wonder if we are truly saved. It says, if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. We examine the evidence of our love, which is the evidence of our salvation. Our hearts are deceitful. God reveals the truth. If 
fact, we read that in Jeremiah 17, verse 9 and 10. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of their deeds. Verse 21. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then we have confidence toward God. And now that's not, the confidence before God is not arrogant or boastful, but knowing we are in relationship with God as our Father emboldens us as His children to stand in His presence. For I am not aware, 1 Corinthians 4, for I am not aware of anything against myself, but I am not thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me. So we have confidence before God. Verse 22. Verse 22 says, And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. It's not to say that God is some cosmic genie who grants our every wish. The end of salvation is the glorification of God in our eternal life with him. Being saved changes us from the heart outward and his desires become our desires. And if we desire the things of God, when we ask him, he gives them. That's what Jesus said when he said, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. And greater works than these will he do because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that my Father, the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Verse 23, and this is his commandment that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another. There it is again. Love one another as he gave us commandment. Jesus commanded his disciples to love one another in the upper room. But first he just demonstrated what it is to love by washing his disciples' feet. Verse 24. And he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him, and he in him. And hereby we know that he abideth in us by the Spirit which he hath given us. Abiding in God means that he abides in us. Keeping God's commandments means we treasure him above all else, and no temptation can draw us away from him. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Jesus said, Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. So, maybe, maybe you're having doubts about your own salvation. I can assure you that is perfectly natural. You wonder if you have done enough for God. And the answer is no. None of us has. You wonder if you love God enough. The answer is no. None of us do. You wonder if you're truly saved. And the answer is, you are saved when God says you are saved. And so I ask you, have, has this love been demonstrated in your life? Do you consistently put others before yourself? Not always, not perfectly, but as a general rule in your life. Jesus said that we would be known as his disciples if we have love for one another. Is that love demonstrated in your everyday living? If, if your friends were polled today, would they say that the defining characteristic of your life is love? Any of us can slip in a moment. The evil one takes that opportunity to tell us, you're no good. God doesn't love you. You're not saved or you wouldn't sin. The question is not whether you, you say you love, but what is the pattern of your life? True agape love has only one source, and that is God. God's spirit dwelling in us bears fruit, and that fruit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. If your life is bearing this fruit, you have God's Spirit dwelling in you. And the evidence of our salvation is our love for one another. Let us pray. Great God of love and life, you are light, and in you is no darkness at all. You are love, which is to say that love as we know it is defined by your standard. And what do we see of your standard? You sent your own son to die the death that we deserve, and he did so willingly, selflessly, obediently, 
The love of Christ was demonstrated in his deeds and in his truth. And so we who are followers of Christ, who are his disciples, pray that the defining characteristic of our lives and of this church would be our love. Love for God, love for neighbor, love for our enemies, love for each other. May we be known by our love and may you be glorified in the demonstration of our love to the world. For we ask it in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Hi, I'm Pastor Brett, and I want to thank you for watching this video. Now, this channel is completely self-funded. There are no uh, sponsors, and I never ask for donations. So if you'd like to help uh, to get this content in front of more people, what you can do is to like, subscribe, and comment on the video. And also, if you think that there's someone else who might want to see this, go ahead and share it with them as well. I want to thank you for watching, and be blessed.